This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Jaehaerys Targaryen, known as the Conciliator and in later life the Old King, is perhaps the single best king Westeros ever saw. During his 55 year reign, alongside his wife and sister, the good Queen Alysanne, they would both reshape the whole of Westeros, from its infrastructure, such as roads, to rebuilding and reshaping King's Landing, introducing fresh water fountains and proper sewage management. He also changed the fundamental laws of Westeros, from the rights of widows, succession, and much more. He was also a strong warrior and a dragon rider, going into battle many times and defending the borders of Westeros from the Dornish incursions. The Seven Kingdoms prospered greatly under his rule and saw a level of peace and growth that would never be matched. Jaehaerys was the third son and fourth child of Prince Aenys Targaryen and his wife, Lady Elissa Velaryon. This would make him the grandson of Aegon the Conqueror and Queen Rhaenys Targaryen. He was born in 34 AC in King's Landing, having two older brothers, Aegon and Viserys, an older sister, Rhaena, and two younger sisters, Alysanne and Vela. Unfortunately, Vela died as a baby. His sister, Rhaena, placed a dragon egg in his cradle after his birth, from which Jaehaerys' dragon, Vermithor, would eventually hatch. When his grandfather, Aegon the Conqueror, died on Dragonstone in 34 AC, his father Aenys ascended the throne. King Aenys was always seen as a very weak and indecisive king. When followers of the Faith of the Seven began an uprising after the king married Jaehaerys' two elder siblings, Rhaena and Aegon, to one another in 41 AC, by the end of the year most of the realm had joined the side of the Faith, and King Aenys, unable to decide how to deal with the rebels, fell ill. In 42 AC he collapsed and died three days later. Some suspect he suffered a stroke, while there are some who believe foul play was involved. Jaehaerys was on Dragonstone for his father's cremation, but within hours, Dowager Queen Alyssa fled to Driftmark, her father's seat, with Jaehaerys and Alysanne, knowing war was almost certainly to be coming. She was right. The Dowager Queen Visenya Targaryen flew to Pentos to retrieve her son, Maegor, from exile, following his polygamous marriage. Once at Dragonstone, Maegor claimed the Iron Throne for his own, ignoring the claims of Jaehaerys' elder brother, Aegon, who many had expected to claim the throne. By 44 AC, Jaehaerys and Alysanne and their mother resided on Dragonstone as the hostages of Dowager Queen Visenya, while Aegon the Young crowned and Rhaena were on the run in the Westerlands. If like Aegon and Rhaena, you happen to be on the run from your murderous dragon riding uncle, you'd want to have the best security and protection you could. It's the same in the real world with your online security. You'd want the best. That's where Surfshark can help. Surfshark is a virtual private network or VPN that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your devices and the internet and masking your IP address. It's especially useful if you often use public Wi-Fi networks while traveling a lot like myself. A VPN keeps your personal data protected from big companies, cyber criminals, or your kingdom's master of whispers. But Surfshark does so much more than just protect your data. My girlfriend is Spanish and for a very long time missed watching her favorite Spanish TV shows. That was until two years ago when I discovered Surfshark by masking your IP address using Surfshark's 3,200 plus servers across 65 different countries. My girlfriend can access Spanish Netflix, Amazon Prime, and many other streaming services by changing her device's virtual location from the UK to Spain, meaning she can now watch her favourite comfort TV shows each night before bed. I tried a few other VPNs before I settled on Surfshark, and the main reason I've stuck with them for the last two years is simple. I found them to be the most reliable, working consistently, so when Surfshark reached out about sponsoring this video, I was more than happy to work with them. Sign up to Surfshark today using the link below and get 83% off, plus an extra three months free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out. So sign up using the link below, or you can use the discount code Westeros in the chaos following Visenya's death of natural causes that year. Jaehaerys, his sister Alysanne, and his mother Alyssa fled along with Jaehaerys' dragon Vermithor and Alysanne's dragon Silverwing. In retaliation, King Maegor had Jaehaerys' elder brother Viserys, who resided at King's Landing, tortured to death. As Jaehaerys' eldest brother, Aegon, had been killed by Maegor in battle the previous year, Jaehaerys thus became the eldest living son of the late King Aenys, and as a result, in the eyes of many, he was now the rightful king of Westeros. However, with the power Maegor held, and the threat of his dragon, the Conqueror's own Balerion the Black Dread, no one would dare question or rise up against King Maegor. Thus Jaehaerys, still but a boy himself, was not going to press his claim. In 47 AC, Maegor forced three widows of proven fertility to marry him in one ceremony. One of these black brides was Jaehaerys' elder sister, Rhaena. 
still without a child of his own, Maegor officially disinherited Jaehaerys and proclaimed Rhaena's daughter by Aegon, Arya, his heir. But by this point, many in the realm had had enough of the brutality and cruelty of King Maegor and began to see Jaehaerys as a banner to rally around, should they get the chance. The realm was beginning to turn against Maegor, from the high lords to the small folk of Fleabottom. While some saw Maegor as necessary to deal with the faith uprising, in times of peace and after the death of his mother, he could no longer be controlled. The first great lord to openly proclaim for Jaehaerys was his second cousin, Lord Rogar Baratheon of Storm's End, who had taken in Jaehaerys, Alysanne and their mother, the Dowager Queen Alyssa. Once Rogar broke ranks, other great houses followed soon, including House Lannister, House Tyrell, House Arryn, some of whom had sided with Maegor during the civil war with Aegon the Young Crown and Rhaena. Rhaena, Jaehaerys' sister, fled from Maegor on her dragon after learning about Jaehaerys' claim, stealing Valerian steel sword Blackfire, the sword of their grandfather, from Maegor in the process. Two of Maegor's own Kingsguard knights, Sir Oliver Bracken and Sir Raymond Mallory, joined Jaehaerys too. In 48 AC, Maegor the Cruel was found dead, seated upon the Iron Throne with cuts to his wrist and covered in blood, while some suspected that while backed into a corner, with his enemies on all sides, Maegor chose to take his own life, while some also suspected that he was murdered or poisoned. In reality, we will never know the truth of the matter. Jaehaerys would arrive before Rogar Baratheon's army on the back of Vermithor. Most of Maegor's few remaining supporters had fled by this time, as Jaehaerys was only 14 years of age. His mother, Dowager Queen Alyssa Valarian, would serve as Queen Regent during the first two years of Jaehaerys' reign, and Lord Rogar Baratheon, whom Jaehaerys had named Lord Protector of the Realm and Hand of the King, would further provide guidance. In the weeks after Maegor's downfall, the young king proved to have wisdom beyond his years, by offering pardons, trials by combat, and in some cases, life in the Night's Watch. To many of the lords who had supported Maegor, word spread and those who had joined the faith militant flocked to King's Landing, wanted to take up the offer of the generous boy king. In 49 AC, Jaehaerys' mother, Queen Regent Elisa Valarium, and Lord Rogar Baratheon, Jaehaerys' hand, were married in the Golden Wedding. Although Jaehaerys liked and respected Rogar for all that he had done for him, he felt slighted and overlooked as Rogar had not asked Jaehaerys' leave to marry his mother. According to accounts, Jaehaerys believed that Rogar's motivation for the marriage was a desire for power and not affection for his mother, and felt that Rogar was overreaching himself. The Queen Regent and the King's Hand began to debate with the small council about a bride for Jaehaerys, as the realm needed heirs sooner rather than later, with no current clear succession plan. Jaehaerys was not present for these discussions, or even aware of them happening, something that made Jaehaerys feel slighted, and as if his mother and stepfather were trying to usurp his power as king and to simply use him as a puppet. Alyssa knew very well that he would choose his younger sister Alassane if it was left to him, but with the recent faith uprising that led to the death of her husband, King Aenys, the rise of Maegor, and the death of two of her sons, she was rightly worried about the prospect of another incestuous marriage, ruling that it was out of the question. Despite numerous suggestions, no suitable candidate could be agreed upon by the council. However, the council did agree quickly on a husband for Princess Alassane, Sir Oren Baratheon, the brother of the Hand of the King. As soon as Alassane discovered her betrothal, she informed Jaehaerys, who acted immediately, angered that once again he was being excluded when it came to such important decisions regarding his rule as king, ordering his kinsguard to discreetly travel to Dragonstone under the cover of darkness, while he and Alassane flew together to the Targaryen stronghold upon their dragons. On Dragonstone, Jaehaerys and Alassane married in secret, but Jaehaerys refused to consummate the marriage, as he believed Alassane still too young, Alassane being 13, the king 15. Rogar and Alyssa arrived soon after the wedding, and upon learning that the marriage had not yet been consummated, Rogar declared that they were not married at all, and ordered that his men secure the royal children. The king's guard defied the hand by forming a wall in front of their king and queen, informing Rogar that he would be the first to die if his men would attack them. Alyssa convinced her husband to return to King's Landing, while Jaehaerys and Alassane remained behind. They would spend the rest of the king's minority at Dragonstone, until Jaehaerys came of age the following year, and was able to take his rule into his own right. Let's take a moment now to talk about Jaehaerys' wife and sister, Good Queen Alysanne. Like most Targaryens, she had the silver hair of Old Valyria. However, unlike most in her family, she lacked the violet eyes, having blue instead. Quite a difference and a striking look. Westeros has seen many queen consorts in the 300 years since Aegon's conquest, but few are remembered so fondly and as well 
as Alessand Targaryen. In many ways, she was more than just Jaehaerys' consort and wife, but a true queen who offered much to the realm in her own right. Over her life, she fundamentally changed Westeros, bringing in and reshaping laws around women's rights, while also outlawing the right to the first knight. She stood up for the rights for women to inherit equally to men, but this battle proved a step too far. She helped reorganize the Night's Watch, making the declining force a better functioning organization. She cared deeply for the health and the lives of the small folk, being a driving force in the creation of free public drinking fountains across King's Landing. She was described as smart enough to have been a maester if she had been born a man. This only scratches the surface of her achievements. She was always there to support her husband politically, and together they would be the best king and queen Westeros ever saw. Their love and close relationship proved to be a huge asset and allowed the drastic changes that happened over Jaehaerys' reign. Jaehaerys and Alysanne would have a total of 13 children, nine of whom survived childhood. However, for the purpose of this tale, we need only focus on three of them. The oldest living son, Aemon, his younger brother, Balon, and their younger sister Alyssa. Aemon Targaryen, the future father of Princess Rhaenys, the queen who never was, was born in 55 AC. He was said to be a clean-limbed and healthy babe with pale lilac eyes. His hair was very pale, shining like white gold, a colour rare even among those of Valerian descent. The night of his birth, his mother placed a dragon egg in his cradle. Thrilled by the news of Prince Aemon's birth, thousands of small folk lined the streets outside the Red Keep in hopes of getting a glimpse of the new heir to the Iron Throne. Hearing their chants and cheers, the king finally mounted the ramparts of the castle's main gate and raised the boy over his head for all to see. A roar went up so loud that it could be heard across the narrow sea. Two years later, in 57 AC, Queen Alassane gave the small folk even more reason to cheer as she gave birth to another son, whom they named Balon, after one of the Targaryen lords who ruled Dragonstone before Aegon's conquest. This Balon would go on to father King Viserys and Prince Daemon Targaryen, the rogue prince. Though Balon was said to be smaller than his elder brother Aemon, at birth, Balon was much louder and lustier. Only two days before his birth, the citadel sent forth a white raven to announce the spring had finally come. Thus, Balon was dubbed the Spring Prince. Prince Aemon was two when his brother was born. Princess Daenerys, his elder sister, four. The two were little alike. The princess was a lively, laughing child who bounced about the Red Keep day and night, everywhere on a broomstick dragon that become her favourite toy. Mud splattered and grass stained, she was a trial to her mother and her maids alike, for they were forever losing track of her. While Prince Aemon, on the other hand, was a very serious boy, cautious, careful and obedient. Though he could not yet read, he loved being read too, and Queen Alassane, laughing, was often heard to say that his first words had been why. As the children grew, Grandmaster Benefer watched them closely. The wounds left by the enmity between the conqueror's sons, Aenys and Maegor, were still fresh in the minds of many older lords. Benefer worried that lest these two boys likewise turn on one another and bathe the realm in blood once again. He need not have been concerned, however. Save me perhaps for twins. No brothers could have ever been closer than the sons of Jaehaerys Targaryen. As soon as he was old enough to walk, Balon followed his brother Aemon everywhere and tried his best to imitate him in everything he did. When Aemon was given his first wooden sword to begin his training in arms, Balon was judged to be too young to join him. But that did not stop him. He made his own sword from a stick and rushed into the yard anyway to begin whacking at his brother, reducing their martyr at arms to a helpless laughter. Thereafter, Balon went everywhere with his stick sword, even to bed, to the despair of his mother and maids. Prince Aemond was shy around the dragons at first, Benefer observed, but not so Balon, who reportedly punched Balerion on the snout the first time he entered the dragon pit. He's either brave or mad, that one. And from that day forth, Balon Targaryen was also now known as Balon the Brave. The young princes loved their sister to distraction. It was plain to see, and Daenerys delighted in the boys, especially in telling them what to do. Grandmaster Benefer noted something else, however. Jaehaerys loved all three of his children fiercely, but from the moment Aemon was born, the king began to speak of him as his heir to Queen Alysanne's displeasure. Daenerys is older, she would remind him. She is the first in line. She should be queen. The king would never disagree, except to say she shall be queen when she and Aemon marry. They were ruled together, just like we have. But Benefer could see that the king's words did not entirely please the queen, as noted in his letters to the citadel. Sadly, Princess Daenerys died of the shivers in 60 AC, much of the grief of her mother, the seven take and the seven give. May perhaps the mother above looked down on Queen Alysanne in her grief, took pity on her broken heart. The moon had not turned twice since Princess Daenerys' death. 
when her grace learned that she was once again carrying a child. With Winter holding the realm in its icy grip, the queen once again chose caution and retired to Dragonstone for her lying in. Late that year, 60 AC, she was delivered a fifth child, a daughter she named Alyssa, after her mother. Alyssa proved to be a lively, healthy child. As a babe, she was so much like her late sister Daenerys, the queen would often weep to behold her, remembering the child she had lost. The likeness faded as the princess grew older, however. Long-faced and skinny, Alyssa had little of her sister's beauty. Her hair was a dirty blonde tangle, with no hint of silver to invoke the dragon lords of old, and she had been born with mismatched eyes. One violet, the other a startling green. Her ears were too big, and her smile slightly lopsided, and when she was six years old, playing in the yard, she was whacked across the face from a wooden sword that broke her nose. It healed slightly crooked, but Alyssa did not seem to care. By that age, her mother had come to realise that it was not Daenerys that she took after, but Balon. Just as Balon had once followed Aemond everywhere, Alyssa trailed after Balon, like a puppy, the Spring Prince complained. Balon was two years younger than Aemond, Alyssa nearly four years younger than him, and a girl, which made it much worse in his eyes. The princess did not act like a girl, however. She wore boys' clothes when she could, shunned the company of other girls, preferred riding and climbing and dueling with wooden swords to sewing and reading and singing, and refused to eat porridge. In 62 AC, the Lords of the Seven Kingdoms rejoiced when King Jaehaerys conferred his eldest son the title of Prince of Dragonstone, making him the acknowledged heir to the Iron Throne. Prince Aemon was seven years of age, a boy tall and handsome as he was modest. He still trained every morning in the yard with Prince Balon. The two brothers were fast friends and have evenly matched. Aemon was taller and stronger, Balon quicker and fiercer. The contest was so spirited they often drew crowds of onlookers, serving men and washerwomen, household knights and squires, maces and septons and stable boys. They would all gather in the yard to cheer on one prince or the other, one of those who came to watch was Jocelyn Baratheon, the late Queen Alyssa's dark-haired daughter and half-sister to Jaehaerys and Alysanne, who grew taller and more beautiful with every passing day. At the feast that followed, Aemon's investiture as Prince of Dragonstone, the Queen sat Lady Jocelyn next to him, and the two young people were observed talking and laughing together through the evening, to the exclusion of all others. Alysanne would give the King another eight children, Megella, Bagon, Dela, Sarah, Gaemon, Valerian and Gael. However, the focus of this video is Aemon, Balon and Alyssa, whose own children would play such a vital role in the Dance of the Dragons. In 68 AC, not long after the birth of Princess Sarah, the King and Queen announced the betrothal of their firstborn son, Aemon, Prince of Dragonstone, to Jocelyn Baratheon of Storm's End. There have been some thoughts after the tragic death of Princess Daenerys that Aemon should wed Princess Alyssa, the eldest of his remaining sisters, but Queen Alysanne firmly put that aside. Alyssa is for Balon, she declared. She has been following him around since they could walk. They are as close as you and I were at their age, she told the king. Two years later in 70 AC, Aemon and Jocelyn were married. Lady Jocelyn, at 16 years old, was one of the greatest beauties of the realm. A long-legged, full-breasted maid with thick, straight black hair that fell to her waist, black as raven's wings. Prince Aemond was one year younger, at 15. They all agreed they made a handsome couple, an inch shy of six feet tall. Jocelyn would have towered over most lords of Westeros, but the Prince of Dragonstone had three inches on her. In 72 AC, a tourney was held at Duskendale in the honour of young Lord Darklyn's wedding. Both the young princes attended together with their sister Alyssa and competed in the squire's melee. Prince Aemond emerged victorious in, the, in part by dint of hammering his brother into submission. Later, he distinguished himself in the lists as well and was awarded knight spurs in his recognition of his skill. He was 17 years of age. With knighthood now achieved, the prince wasted no time in becoming a dragon rider as well, ascending into the skies for the first time not long after his return to King's Landing. His mount was the blood-red Caraxes, fiercest of all the young dragons in the dragon pit. The dragon keepers who knew the dragons of the pit better than anyone called him the blood worm. Wherever Prince Aemon went, whatever Prince Aemon did, Prince Balon would not be far behind, as the wags at court often observed. The truth of that was proven in 73 AC. When Balon the Brave followed his brother into knighthood, Aemon had won his spurs at 17, so Balon must need do the same at 16. Travelling across the reach to Old Oak, where Lord Oakheart was celebrating the birth of a son with seven days of jousting, Dressed as a mystery knight and calling himself the Silver Fool, the young prince overthrew Lord Rowan, Sir Alan Ashford, both Fossaway twins and Lord Oakheart's own heir, Sir Dennis, before falling to Sir Rickard Redwine. After helping him to his feet, Sir Rickard unmasked him, bade him kneel and knighted him on the spot. Prince Balon lingered only long enough to partake of the feast that evening before galloping back to King's Landing to complete his quest to become a dragon rider. Never one to be overshadowed, he had long since chosen the dragon he wished to mount, and now he claimed her. 
unridden since the death of the Dowager Queen Visenya 29 years before. The great she-dragon Vagar spread her wings, roared, and launched herself once more into the skies, carrying the Spring Prince across Blackwater Bay to Dragonstone to surprise his brother Aemon and Caraxes. In 74 AC, King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne were blessed again by the gods when Prince Aemon's wife Lady Jocelyn presented them with their first grandchild. Princess Rhaenys was born on the seventh day of the seventh moon of the year, which the Septons judged to be highly auspicious. Large and fierce, she had the black hair of her Baratheon mother and the pale violet eyes of her Targaryen father. As the firstborn child of Prince of Dragonstone, many held her as the next in line for the Iron Throne after her father. When Queen Alysanne held her in her arms for the first time, she was heard to call the little girl our queen-to-be. In breeding, as in so much else, Balon the Brave was not far behind his brother, Aemon. In 75 AC, the Red Keep was the site of another splendid wedding, as the Spring Prince took to bride the eldest of his sisters, Princess Alyssa. The bride was 15, the groom 18. Unlike the father and mother, Balon and Alyssa did not wait to consummate their union. The bedding that followed, their wedding feast, was a source of much rabid humour in the days that followed, for the young bride's sounds of pleasure could be heard all the way to Duskendale, men said. A shire maid might have been abashed by that, but Alyssa Targaryen was as broadly a wench as any barmaid in King's Landing, as she herself was fond of boasting. I mounted him and took him for a ride, she declared the morning after the bedding, and I mean to do the same tonight. Like her brothers before her, Alyssa Targaryen meant to be a dragon rider, and sooner rather than later, Aemon had flown at 17, Balon at 16, Alyssa meant to do it at 15. According to the tales set down by the dragon keepers, it was all they could do to persuade her not to claim Balerion. He is old and slow, princess, they had to tell her. Surely you want a swift amount. In the end, they prevailed. Princess Alyssa ascended the sky upon Maelys, a splendid scarlet she-dragon, never before ridden. The princess was seldom long away from the dragon pit after that day. Flying was the second sweetest thing in the world, she would often say, and the very sweetest thing could not be mentioned in the company of ladies. The dragon keepers had not been wrong. Melis was as swift as a dragon as Westeros had ever seen, easily outpacing Craxus and Vagar when she and her brothers flew together. Prince Balon had not ceased smiling since his marriage. When not aloft, Balon and Alyssa spent every hour together, most often in their bedchamber. Prince Balon was a lusty lad, for those same shrieks of pleasure echoed through the halls of the Red Keep on the night of their bedding were heard night after night in the years that followed. As soon enough, a much hoped for result appeared. Alyssa Targaryen grew great with child. In 77 AC, gave her brave prince a son they named Viserys. Septon Bath described the boy as a plump and pleasant lad who laughed more than any babe he'd ever known and nursed so lustily he drank his wet nurse dry. Against all advice, his mother clapped the boy in the swaddling cloth, strapped into her chest, and took him aloft on Maylis when he was only nine days old. Afterwards, she claimed that Viserys had giggled the entire time. Prince Aemon reached his 26th name day in 81 AC and had proved himself more than able in both war and peace. As the heir apparent to the Iron Throne, it felt desirable that he take a greater role in the governance of the realm as a member of the King's Council. Accordingly, King Jaehaerys named the prince his Justicar, a master of laws, in place of Roderick Aaron. I will lead the making of laws to you, brother. Prince Balon declared whilst drinking to Prince Aemon's appointment. I would sooner make sons. And that was just what he did. For that same year, Alyssa bore her spring prince a second son, who was given the name Daemon. His mother, irrepressible as ever, took the babe into the sky in Maelys within a fortnight of his birth, just as she had done with his brother Viserys. The 83rd year after Aegon's conquest is remembered as the year of the Fourth Dornish War, better known by most as Prince Morian's Madness, or the War of the Hundred Candles. The old Prince of Dawn had died, and his son, Morian Martell, had succeeded him in Sunspear. A rash and foolish young man, Prince Morian had long bristled at his father's cowardice during Lord Rogar's war, when the Knights of the Seven Kingdom had marched into the Red Mountains unmolested, whilst the Dornish army stayed at home and left the Vulture King to his fate. Determined to avenge this stain on Dornish honour, the prince planned his own invasion of the Seven Kingdoms. Though he knew Dawn could not hope to prevail against the might of the Iron Throne, Prince Morian thought that he might take King Jaehaerys unawares and conquer the Stormlands as far as Storm's End, or at the very least Cape Wrath. Rather than attack by way of the prince's pass, 
he planned to come by sea. He would assemble his host at Ghost Hill and Tor, load them on ships, and sail across the Sea of Dawn, take the Stormlanders unawares. If he was defeated or driven back, so be it. But before he went, he swore to burn a hundred towns and raise a hundred castles, so that the Stormlanders might know they could never again march into the Red Mountains with impunity. The madness of this plan can be seen in the fact that there are neither a hundred towns, nor a hundred castles on Cape Wrath, nor a third of that number. Dawn had not boasted any strength at sea since Nymeria burned her 10,000 ships centuries before. Prince Morian did have gold, and he found willing allies in the pirates at the Stepstones, the Sail Sails of Mere, and the Corsairs at the Pepper Coast. Though it took him the best part of a year, the ships came straggling in, and the prince and his spearmen were loaded aboard. Morian had been weaned on tales of past Dornish glory, and like many young Dornish lords, had seen the sun motted bones of the dragon Maraxis at Hellholt, who had fallen during Aegon the Conqueror's attempt to conquer Dawn. Every ship in his fleet was therefore manned with crossbows, and equipped with massive scorpions of the sort that had failed Maraxis, and taken the lives of the dragon and Queen Rhaenys that day. If the Targaryens dared to send dragons, against him, he would feel the air with bolts and kill them all. The folly of Prince Morian's plan cannot be overstated. His hopes of taking the Iron Thrones unawares were frankly laughable from the start. Not only did Jaehaerys have spies in Morian's own court and friends amongst the shrewder Dornish lords, but the pirates of the Stepstones, the Cell Cells of Mir, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast are none of them famed for their discretion. A few coins changing hands was all it took. By the time Morian set sail, the king had known of the attack for half a year. Bormund Baratheon, Bormund Baratheon, Jaehaerys' half-brother, the son of Rogar and Alyssa, and now Lord of Storm's End, had been made aware as well, and was waiting on Cape Wrath to give the Dornishmen a red welcome when they came ashore, but he would never have a chance. Jaehaerys Targaryen and his sons, Aemon and Balon, had been waiting as well, and as Morian's fleet beat its way across the Sea of Dawn, the dragons Vermithor, Caraxes, and Vagar fell on them out of the clouds. Shouts rang out, and the Dornish filled the air with scorpion bolts, but firing at a dragon is one thing, and killing it is quite another. A few bolts glanced off the scales of the dragons, and one punched through Vagar's wing, but none of them found any vulnerable spots and the dragons swooped and banked and loosed great blasts of fire. One by one, ships went up in gouts of flame. They were still burning when the sun went down, like a hundred candles floating on the sea. Burned bodies would wash up on the shores of Cape Breath for half a year, but not a single living Dornishman set foot upon the Stormlands. The Fourth Dornish War was fought and won in a single day. The pirates of the Stepstones, the Sail Sails of Mere, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast became less troublesome for some time, and Mara Martel became Princess of Dawn. Back in King's Landing, King Jaehaerys and his sons received a riotous welcome. Aegon the Conqueror had never won a war without losing a single man. Prince Balon had another court for celebration as well. His wife, Alyssa, was again with child. This time, he told his brother Aemon he was praying for a girl. Princess Alyssa was brought to bed again in 84 AC. After a long and difficult labour, she gave Prince Balon a third son, a boy they named Aegon after the Conqueror. They call me Balon the Brave, the prince told his wife at her bedside. But you are far braver than me. I would sooner fight a dozen battles than do what you have just done. Alyssa just laughed at him. You were made for battles. I was made for this. Viserys and Daemon and Aegon, that made three. As soon as I am well, let's make another. I wish to give you twenty sons and an army of your own. It was not to be. Alyssa Targaryen had a warrior's heart in a woman's body, and her strength sadly failed her. She never fully recovered from Aegon's birth and died within a year at the age of 24. Nor did Prince Aegon long survive his mother. He perished six months later, still shy of his first birthday. Though shattered by his loss, Balon took solace in the two strong sons that Alyssa had left him, Viserys and Daemon, and never ceased to honour the memory of his sweet lady with a broken nose and mismatched eyes. During 88 AC, Jaehaerys, during a brief estrangement from his queen, after a disagreement regarding their daughter, Princess Sarah, flew to Castley Rock and the other great seats of the West alone. He called on Fair Isle, as the despised Lord Franklin was safely in his grave. The king was gone far longer than he had originally intended. He had roadworks to inspect, and found himself making unplanned stops at smaller towns and castles, delighting many petty lords and landed knights, and the small folk as he went. Prince Aemond joined him at certain castles, Prince Balon and others, but neither could persuade him to return home to the Red Keep. It had been too long since I have seen my kingdom, and listened to my people, he told his sons. King's Landing will do well enough in your hands, and your mother's. For the entire year of 89 AC, 
the king remained on the move. At Highgarden, he was joined for a short while by his granddaughter, Princess Rhaenys, who flew at his side on Maelys, the Red Queen. Together, they visited the Shield Islands, where the king had never been before. Jaehaerys made a point of landing on all four shields. It was on Grease Shield, in Lord Chester's Hall, that Princess Rhaenys told him of her plans to marry Sir Corlys Velaryon, the Lord of Driftmark, and received the king's blessing. You could not have picked a better man, he said. The maesters of the time referred to the estrangement between the king and queen as the Great Rift. The passage of time and the subsequent quarrel that was near and bitter gave it a new name, the First Quarrel, which is how it is known to this day. We shall speak of the second one. In good time, it was one of their younger daughters, Septa Megella Targaryen, who bridged the rift between them. This is foolish, father, she said to him. Rhaenys is to be married next year and should be a great occasion. She'll want all of us there, including both you and mother. The Archmaesters call you the conciliator. I have heard. It is time that you conciliated. The scolding had the desired effect. And two weeks later, King Jaehaerys returned at last to King's Landing and Queen Alysanne returned from her own self-imposed exile on Dragonstone. What words passed between them, we can never know. But for a good while after, they were once again as close as they'd ever been before. In the 19th year since Aegon's conquest, king and queen shared one of their last good times together as they celebrated the wedding of their eldest grandchild, Princess Rhaenys, to call us Valarian of Driftmark, Lord of the Tides. At 37, the Sea Snake was already hailed as the greatest seafarer Westeros had ever known. But with his nine great voyages behind him, he had come home to marry and make a family. Only you could have won me away from the sea he told the princess at their wedding. I came back from the end of the earth for you. Rhaenys was 16, a fearless young beauty, and more than a match for her mariner, a dragon rider since the age of 13. She insisted upon arriving to the wedding on Maelys, the Red Queen, the magnificent scarlet she-dragon that had once borne her aunt Alyssa. We can go back to the ends of the earth together, she promised Sir Corlys, but I'll get there first, as I'll be flying. That was a good day. Queen Alysanne would say, with a sad smile, through the years that remained to her. She was 54 that year, but sad to say, she did not have many good days left. It is not within our scope to chronicle the endless wars, intrigues and rivalries of the three cities of Essos, save where they intersect with the fortunes of House Targaryen and the Seven Kingdoms. One such time occurred during the years 91-92 to AC, during what is known as the Mirish Bloodbath. Suffice it to say that in the city of Myr, Two rival factions vied for supremacy. There are assassinations, riots, poisonings, rapes, hangings, tortures, sea battles, before one side emerged supreme. The losing faction, driven from the city, tried to establish themselves first upon the Stepstones, only to be hounded from there as well, when the Archon of Tyrosh made common cause with the League of Pirate Kings. In their desperation, the Myrmen next turned to the island of Tarth, where their landings took the Evenstar by surprise. In a short time, they had taken the entire eastern side of the island. By this point, the Mirish were little more than pirates themselves, a ragged band of rogues. Neither the king nor his council felt would require much to drive them back into the sea. Prince Aemon would lead the assault, it was decided. The Mirishmen did have some strength at sea, so the sea snake, Corlys Valarian, would first need to bring the Valarian fleet south to protect Lord Bormund Baratheon as he crossed to Tarth with his Stormlanders to join with the Evenstar's own levies. Their combined strength would be more than sufficient to retake all of Tarth from the Mirish pirates relatively quickly, and if there proved to be unexpected difficulties, Prince Aemon would have Caraxes. He does love the burn, the prince said. Lord Corlys and his fleet set sail from Driftmark on the ninth day of the third moon of 92 AC. Prince Aemon followed a few hours later after bidding farewell to Lady Jocelyn and their daughter Rhaenys. The princess had just learned she was with child, or else she would have accompanied her father on Maelys. Into battle, the prince said, as if I'd have ever permitted that. You have your own battle to fight. Lord Corlys will want a son, I am sure, and I would like a grandson. Those were the last words he would ever speed his daughter. Caraxes swiftly outdistanced the sea snake and his fleet, dropping down out of the sky on Tarth. Lord Cameron, the even star of Tarth, had fallen back into the spine of a mountain that ran down the centre of his island and established a small camp in a hidden valley from which he could look down on the mirish movements below. Prince Aemon met him there and the two made battle plans together whilst Caraxes devoured half a dozen goats. But the Even Star's camp was not as hidden as it appeared, and the smoke from the dragon fire drew eyes of a pair of Mirish scouts who were creeping through the heights unawares. One of them recognized the Even Star as he strode through the camp at dusk, talking with Prince Aemon. 
the men of Mir are indifferent sailors and feeble soldiers. Their weapon of choice are daggers and crossbows, preferably poisoned. One of the Mira's scouts wound his crossbow now behind the rock where he was hidden. Rising, taking a deep breath, he took aim on the even star a hundred yards below and loosed his bolt. Dusk and distance made his aim less than certain, and the bolt missed Lord Cameron and struck Prince Amund, standing at his side. The iron bolt punctured through the prince's throat and out the back of his neck. The Prince of Dragonstone fell to his knees and grasped the crossbow bolt, as if to try and pull it from his throat, but his strength was gone. Aemon Targaryen died struggling to speak, drowned on his own blood. He was 37 years old. How can words tell of the grief that swept the Seven Kingdoms then, of the pain felt by King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne, of Lady Jocelyn's empty bed and bitter tears, and the way Princess Rhaenys wept to know her father would never hold her child? Far easier to speak of was Prince Balon's wrath and how he came down upon Tarth on Vagar, howling for vengeance for his fallen brother. The Mira's ships burned as Prince Morian's ships had burned nine years earlier, and when the Evenstar and Lord Bormont descended from them from the mountains, they had nowhere to escape to. They were all cut down by the thousands and left to rot along the beaches, so every wave that washed the shore for a few days was tinged pink. Balon the Brave played his part in the slaughter. When he returned to King's Landing with his brother's body, the small folk lined the streets, screaming his name and hailing him a hero and an avenger. But it was said that when he saw his mother again, he fell into her arms and wept. I slew a thousand of them, he said, but it would not bring him back. And the Queen stroked his hair and said, I know. Seasons came and went in the years that followed. There were hot days and warm days, and days where salt winds blew, bouncing off the sea. There were fields of flowers in the spring, and bountiful harvest of and golden autumn afternoons. All across the realm, the roads that Jahara spent so long building crept onwards, and new bridges spanned old streams. The king took no pleasure in any of it, so far as men could tell. It was always winter now, he said to Septon Bath one night, when he had drunk too much. Since Eamon's death, he had always drunk a cup or three of honeyed wine at night to help him sleep. The following year, in 93 AC, Prince Balon's 16-year-old son, Viserys, entered the dragon pit and claimed Beleriand the Black Dread. The old dragon had stopped growing at last, but he was sluggish and heavy and hard to rouse, and he struggled when Viserys urged him up into the air. The young prince flew three times around the city before landing again. He had intended to fight a dragonstone, he told his father afterwards, but he did not think the Black Dread had the strength for it. Less than a year later, Valerian was gone, the last living creature in all the world who saw Valyria in its glory. Jaehaerys' best friend, Setsun Bath, himself died four years later, in 98 AC. Grandmaster Elsa preceded him by half a year. Lord Redwine had died in 89 AC. His son Robert soon there took after. New men took all of their places, but Jaehaerys truly the old king by then, and sometimes he would walk into the council chamber and think, who are these men, do I know them? His grace grieved for Prince Aemon until the end of his days, but the old king never dreamed that Aemon's death in 92 AC would be the hell horns of Valyrian legend, bringing death and destruction down on all those who heard its sound. The last years of Alassane Targaryen were sad and lonely ones. In her youth, good Queen Alassane had loved her subjects, lords and commons alike. She had loved her women's courts, listening, learning, and doing what she could to make the realm a kinder place. She had seen more of the Seven Kingdoms than any queen before or since, slept in a hundred castles, charmed a hundred lords, and made a hundred marriages. She had loved music, had loved to dance, had loved to read, and oh, how she had loved to fly. Silverwing had carried her to Old Town, to the Wall, and to a thousand places in between, and Alisan saw them all as few others ever would, looking down from above the clouds. All these loves were lost to her in the last years of her life. My uncle Magor was cruel, Alisan was heard to say. Age is much crueler, worn out from childbirth, travel and grief. She grew thin and frail after Aemon's death. Climbing hills became a trial to her, and in 95 AC she slipped and fell on the serpentine steps, breaking her hip. Thereafter, she had to walk with a cane. Her hearing began to fail as well, and music was lost to her. And when she tried to sit into council meetings with the king, she could no longer understand half what was being said. She was far too unsteady to fly. Silverwing last carried her into the sky in 93 AC, when she came to earth again and climbed painfully from the dragon's back. The queen wept. More than all of these, though, she had loved her children. No mother ever loved a child more, Grandmaster Benefer once told her, before the shivers carried him away. In the last days of her life, 
Queen Alassane reflected on his words. He was wrong, I think, she wrote. For surely the mother above loved my children more. She took so many of them away from me. No mother should ever have to burn a child, the Queen had said at the funeral pyre of her son Valerian. But of the 13 children she bore King Jaehaerys, only three of them would survive her. Aegon, Gaiman and Valerian died as babes. The Shivers took Princess Daenerys away at the age of six. Crossbow Bolt had slew Prince Aemon. Alyssa and Dela died in childbed. Viserra drunk in the street. Set to Megella, the gentle soul had died in 96 AC. Her arms and legs turned to stone by Greyscale, for she had spent her last years nursing those afflicted with the horrible condition. Saddest of all was the loss of Princess Gale. The winter child born in 80 AC, when Queen Alysanne was 44 and thought well past her childbearing years. A sweet-natured girl, but frail, and somewhat simple-minded, she remained with the queen long after all her other children had grown and gone. But in 99 AC, she vanished from court, and soon afterwards, it was announced that she had died of a summer fever. Only after both her parents were gone, did the true tale come out. Seduced and abandoned by a travelling singer, the princess had given birth to a stillborn son. Then, overwhelmed by grief, walked into the waters of Blackwater Bay and drowned. Some say that Alisanne never recovered from that loss, from her winter child alone had been her true companion during her declining years. Sarah still lived somewhere in Volantis, an infamous woman but a wealthy one, but she was dead to Jaehaerys, and the letters Alisanne had secretly sent her from time to time all went unanswered. Vagon was an archmaster at the Citadel, a cold and distant son, he had grown to be a cold and distant man. He wrote as a son ought, his words were dutiful, but there was no warmth to them and it had been years since Alassane had last seen his face. Only Balon the Brave remained near her, till the end. Her spring prince had visited her as often as he was able, and always won a smile from her. But Balon was Prince of Dragonstone, Hand of the King, forever coming and going, sitting at his father's side at councils, treating with the lords. You will be a great king, even greater than your father, Alassane told him the last time they were together. She did not know. How could she have known? After the death of Princess Gale, King's Landing and the Red Keep had become unbearable to Alisanne. She could no longer serve as she once had, as a partner to the king in his labours, and the court was full of strangers whose names Alisanne could not quite recall. Seeking peace, she returned once more to Dragonstone, where she had spent the happiest days of her life with Jaehaerys, between their first and second marriages. The old king would join her there, when he could. How is it I am the old king now, but you are still the good queen? He asked her once. Alisanne laughed. I am old as well, but I am still younger than you. Alessand Targaryen, the good queen, died on Dragonstone on the first day of the seventh moon of 100 AC, or for 100 years since Aegon's conquest. She was 64. The seeds of war are often planted long before, during times of peace, and so it has always been with Westeros. The bloody struggle for the Iron Throne between brother and sister, Dragon and Dragon, known as the Dance of the Dragons, fought from 129 to 131 AC, had its very roots half a century before, during the longest and most peaceful reign that any of the Conqueror's descendants enjoyed, that of Jaehaerys Targaryen the Conciliator. The old king and good queen Alysanne ruled together until her death in 100 AC and produced 13 children. Four of them, two sons and two daughters, grew to maturity, married and produced children of their own. Never before or since had the Seven Kingdoms been blessed or cursed in the view of some with so many Targaryens. From the loins of the old king and his beloved queen sprang such a confusion of claims and claimants that many maesters believed that the Dance of Dragons or some similar struggle was inevitable at some point, but few could predict how bloody and bitter it would truly be. It was not apparent in the early years of Jaehaerys' reign, for in Prince Aemon and Prince Balon, Jaehaerys had had an heir and a spare, and seldom had the realm been blessed with two more able princes. In 62 AC, at the age of seven, Aemon was formally anointed the Prince of Dragonstone and heir to the throne. Knighted at 17, a tawny champion of 20, he had become his father's Justicar at the age of 26. Though he never served his father as Hand of the King, that was only because the office was occupied by Septon Barth, the old king's most trusted friend. Nor was Balon Targaryen any less accomplished. The younger prince earned his knighthood at 16 and was wed at 18. Though he and Aemon enjoyed a healthy rivalry, no men doubted their love and bond. The succession appeared as solid as stone, but the stone somehow began to crack in 92 AC, when Aemon, Prince of Dragonstone, was slain on Tarth by a merish crossbow bolt meant for the man beside him. The king and queen mourned his loss, and the realm with them, but no man was more bereft than Prince Balon, who avenged his brother by driving the Meermen back into the sea. 
On his return to King's Landing, Balon was hailed as a hero by the cheering crowds and embraced by his father, who named him Prince of Dragonstone and the heir to the Iron Throne. It was a popular decree. The small folk loved Balon, and the lords of the realm saw him as his brother's obvious successor. But Prince Aemon had a child. His daughter Rhaenys, born in 74 AC, had grown into a clever, capable, and beautiful woman. In 90 AC, at the age of 16, she had married the King's Admiral and Master of Ships, Corlys of House Valarian, Lord of the Tides, known as the Sea Snake after his most famous ship. Moreover, Princess Rhaenys was pregnant when her father died. By granting Dragonstone to Balon, King Jaehaerys was not only passing over Rhaenys, but also a possible unborn son. However, the King's decision was in accord with well-established practice. Aegon the Conqueror had been the first Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, not his sister Visenya, two years his elder. Jaehaerys himself had followed his usurping uncle Maegor on the Iron Throne. That order of birth alone ruled, his sister Rhaena had a better claim. Jaehaerys did not make his decision lightly. He is known to have discussed it at length for hours at a time with the small council. Undoubtedly, he consulted Septon Bath, as he did on all important matters, and the views of Grandmaster Elsa were also given much weight. All were in accord. Balon, a seasoned knight of 35, was better suited to rule than the 18-year-old Princess Rhaenys or her unborn baby, who might or might not be a boy. Whereas Prince Balon had already sired two healthy and grown sons in Viserys and Daemon, the love of the commons was also a big factor in the support for Balon the Brave. Some dissented. Rhaenys herself was the first to raise objections. You would rob my son of his birthright, she told the king, with a hand upon her swollen belly. Her husband, Corlys Valarian was so wroth that he gave up his admiralty and his place on the small council and took his wife back to Driftbark. Lady Jocelyn of House Baratheon, Rhaenys' mother and Jaehaerys' half-sister, was also angered as was her formidable brother Bormund, Lord of Storm's End. The most prominent dissenter was good Queen Alysanne, who had helped her husband rule the Seven Kingdoms for many years, and now saw her son's daughter being passed over because of her gender. A ruler need a good head and a true heart, she famously told the king. The right genitals is not essential. If your grace truly believes that women lack the wit to rule, plainly you have no further need of me. And thus, Queen Alessandra departed King's Landing and flew to Dragonstone on her dragon, Silverwing. She and the king remained apart for the next two years, the period of estrangement recorded in histories as the Second Quarrel. The old king and the good queen were again reconciled in 94 AC by the good offices of their daughter, Septime Gela, but never reached a court on the succession. The queen died of a wasting illness in 100 AC at the age of 64, still insisting that her granddaughter, Rhaenys, and her child had been unfairly cheated of their rights. The boy in the belly, the unborn child who had been the subject of so much debate, proved to be a girl when born in 93 AC. Her mother named her Lena. The next year, Rhaenys gave birth to her brother, Laenor. However, Prince Baelord was firmly encosted as the heir apparent by then. It House Valerian House Baratheon claimed to the belief that young Laenor had a better claim to the throne, and some, although a few, argued for the rights of his elder sister, Lena, and their mother Rhaenys. In the last years of her life, the god stout queen Alysanne in many cruel blows, as has previously been recounted. Her grace knew joys as well and sorrow during those same years, however. Chief amongst them were her grandchildren. There were weddings as well. In 93 AC, she attended the wedding of Prince Balon's eldest son, Viserys, to Lady Emma Arryn, the 11-year-old child of the late Princess Dela Targaryen. The marriage was not consummated until two years later, however, given the bride's age. In 97, the good queen saw Balon's second son, Daemon, take to wife Lady Rey of House Royce, heir to the ancient castle of Runestone in the Vale. The great tourney held in King's Landing in 98 AC to celebrate the 50th year of Jaehaerys' reign surely gladdened the queen's heart as well. For most of her surviving children, grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren returned to share in feasts and celebrations. Long since the Doom of Valyria had so many dragons been seen in one place at one time. After the death of the king's beloved friend and hand, Septon Barth, he struggled to find a suitable new replacement. He turned to his son, Balon, to replace him. And in 99 AC, the Prince of Dragonstone became the hand of the king as well. He performed his duties admirably. Though less scholarly than Barth, the prince proved a good judge of men, and surrounded himself with loyal subordinates and counsellors. The realm would be well ruled when Balon Targaryen sat the Iron Throne. The lords and the common folk all agreed, but sadly it was not to be, and the result would bathe the realm in the blood of House Targaryen. In 101 AC, Prince Balon complained of a stitch in his side whilst hunting in the Kingswood. The pain worsened when he returned to the city. His belly swelled and hardened, and the pain grew so severe it left him bedridden. Runciter, the new Grandmaster, 
only recently arrived from the citadel, was able to bring the prince's fever down somewhat and give him some relief from the agony with milk of the poppy, but his condition continued to worsen, and quickly. On the fifth day of his illness, Prince Balon died in his bedchamber in the Tower of the Hand, with his father sitting beside him, holding his hand. After opening the corpse, Grand Maester Runciter put down the cause of death as a burst belly. All the seven kingdoms wept for Balon the Brave, and none more so than Jaehaerys. This time, when he lit his son's funeral pyre, he did not even have the comfort of his beloved wife beside him. The old king had never been so alone, and now, again, his grace faced a nettlesome dilemma, for once more the succession was in doubt. With both of his heirs apparent, dead and buried, there was no longer a clear successor to the Iron Throne, but that was not to say there was any lack of claimants for it. Prince Balon had sired three sons by his sister Alyssa. Two, Viserys and Daemon, still lived. Had Balon ever taken the Iron Throne, Viserys would have followed him without question, but the Crown Prince's tragic death at the age of 44 muddied the succession. The claims of Princess Rhaenys and her daughter Elena were put forward once again, and even if they were to be passed over on account of their gender, Rhaenys his infant son, Lenor, faced no such impediment. Lenor Valarian was male and could claim descent from Jaehaerys' elder son, while Balon's boys were descended from the younger. Moreover, King Jaehaerys still had one surviving son, Vagon, an archmaster at the Citadel, the holder of the Ring and the Rod and the Mask of Yellow Gold, known to history as Vagon the Dragonless. His very existence had largely been forgotten by most of the Seven Kingdoms. Though only 40 years of age, Vagon was pale and frail, a bookish man, devote to alchemy, astronomy, mathematics, and other arcane arts. Even as a boy, he had never been well liked. Few considered him a true viable choice to sit the Iron Throne. And yet, despite this, it was to Archmaster Vagon that the old king turned now, summoning his last surviving son to King's Landing. What passed between them it remains a matter of dispute. Some say the king offered Vagon the Iron Throne and was refused. Others assert that he only sought his counsel Report had reached court that Corlys Valarian was amassing ships and men on Driftmark to defend the rights of his son, Lenor, whilst Daemon Targaryen, a hot-tempered and quarrelsome young man of twenty, had gathered his own band of sworn swords in support of his brother, Viserys. A violent struggle for succession was likely, no matter who the old king named to succeed him. No doubt, that is why his grace seized eagerly on the solution offered by Archmaester Vagon. King Jaehaerys announced his intent to convene a great council to discuss, debate, and ultimately decide the matter of succession. All the great and lesser lords of Westeros would be invited to attend, together with maesters from the citadel of Old Town and scepters and septons, to speak for the faith. Let the claimants make their case before the assembled lords, his grace decreed. He would abide by the council's decision, whomever they might choose. It was decided that the council would be held at Harrenhal, the largest castle in the realm. No one knew how many lords would come, since no such council had ever been held before, but it was thought prudent to have room for at least 500 lords and their tails. More than a thousand lords attended. It took half a year for them to assemble. A few even arrived as the council was breaking up. Even the mighty Harrenhal could not contain such multitudes. Each lord was accompanied by a retinue of knights, squires, grooms, cooks and serving men. Tymon Lannister, the lord of Castle Rock, brought 300 men with him. Not to be outdone, Lord Mathis Tyrell of Highgarden brought 500. Lords came from every corner of the realm, from the Dornish Marches to the Shadow of the Wall, from the Three Sisters to the Iron Islands. From Winterfell came Lord Eled Stark, from River Run, Lord Grover Tully, from the Vale, Yobert Royce, regent and protector for the young Jane Arryn, Lady of the Eyrie. Even the Dornishmen were represented. The Prince of Dawn sent his daughter and 20 Dornish knights to Harrenhal to observe. The High Septon came from Old Town to bless the assembly. Merchants and tradesmen descended upon Harrenhal by the hundreds. Hedge knights and free riders came in hopes of finding work for their swords. Cut purses came seeking after coin. Old women and young girls came seeking husbands. Thieves and whores and washerwomen and camp followers, singers and mummers, they all came from east to west and north to south. A city of tent sprung up outside the walls of Harrenhal and along the lake shore for Lee in each direction. For a time, Harrington and the area around Harrenhal was the fourth city in the realm. Only Old Town King's Landing and Lannisport were larger in population and size. No fewer than 14 claims were duly examined and considered by the lords assembled. From Essos came three rival competitors, grandsons of King Jaehaerys, through his long-lost daughter Sarah, each sired by a different father. One was said to be the very image of his grandsire in his youth. 
another, a bastard born of the Triarch of Old Volantis, arrived with bags of gold and a dwarf elephant. The lavish gifts he distributed amongst the poorer lords undoubtedly helped his claim. The elephant proved less helpful. Princess Sarah herself was still alive and well in Volantis, and only 34 years of age. Her own claim was clearly superior to those of, of any of her bastard sons, but she did not choose to press it. Have my own kingdom here, she said, when asked if she meant to return to Westeros. Another claimant produced sheaves of parchment that demonstrated his descent from Gaiman the Glorious, the greatest of the Targaryen lords of Dragonstone, before Aegon's conquest, by way of a younger daughter and the petty lord she had married, and on for seven further generations. There was as well a strapping red-haired man-at-arms who claimed to be a bastard son of Maegor the Cruel. By way of proof, he brought his mother, an aged innkeep's daughter, who had said that she had once been sold to Maegor when he gave her father a copious amount of gold. The lords were well prepared to believe the fact of the woman's virtue being brought and sold, but not that the act had gotten her with child. With no proof, the man was even Maegor. The great council deliberated for 13 days, but the whole process took months. The tenuous claims of nine lesser competitors were considered and discarded. One such, a hedge knight, who had put himself forward as a natural son of King Jaehaerys himself, was seized and imprisoned when the king exposed him as a liar. Archmaster Vagon was ruled out on the account of his vows and Princess Rhaenys and her daughter on account of their gender, leaving the two claimants with the most support. Viserys Targaryen, the eldest son of Prince Balon and Princess Alyssa, and Lenor Valarian, the son of Princess Rhaenys and the grandson of Prince Aemon. Viserys was the old king's grandson, Lenor his great-grandson. The principal of primogeniture favoured Lenor, the principal of proximity, Viserys. Viserys had also been the last Targaryen to ride Balerion, that after the death of the Black Dread in 94 AC, he never mounted another dragon, whereas the boy Lenor had yet to take flight upon his young dragon, a splendid grey and white beast he named Sea Smoke. But Viserys' claim derived from his father, Lenor's from his mother, and most of the lords felt that the male line must take precedence over the female. Moreover, Viserys was a man of 24, Lenor a boy of 7. For all these reasons, Lenor's claim was generally regarded as the weaker, but the boy's mother and father were such powerful and influential figures that it could not be dismissed in its entirety. Corlys Valerian's famous nine voyages across the world had left him a fortune, even eclipsing the wealth of House Lannister for some time. Lord Corlys was an ambitious man. During his nine voyages on the Sea Snake, he was forever wanting to press onward, to go where none had gone before and see what lay beyond the maps. Though he had accomplished much and more in life, he was seldom satisfied. The men who knew him best would say, in Rhaenys Targaryen, daughter of the old king's eldest son and heir, he had found his perfect match. A woman as spirited and beautiful and proud as any in the realm, and a dragon rider as well. His sons and daughters would soar through the skies, Lord Corlys expected. And one day, one of them would sit the Iron Throne. Unsurprisingly, the sea snake was bitterly disappointed when Prince Aemon died, and King Jaehaerys bypassed Aemon's daughter Rhaenys in favour of his brother, Balon the Spring Prince. But now it seemed the wheel had turned yet again, and that wrong could now be righted. Thus did Lord Corlys and his wife, the Princess Rhaenys, arrive at Harrenhal in high state, using the wealth and influence of House Valarian to persuade the laws assembled that their son, Lenor should be recognised as heir to the Iron Throne. In these efforts, they were joined by the Lord of Storm's End, Bormund Baratheon, great-uncle to Rhaenys and great-great-uncle to the boy Lenor, by Lord Stark of Winterfell, Lord Manderley of White Harbour, Lord Dustin of Barriton, Lord Blackwood of Raventree, and Lord Bar Emmon of Sharp Point, Lord Caltegar of Claw Isle, among others. They were nowhere near enough, Though Lord and Lady Valarian were eloquent and open-handed in their efforts on behalf of their son, the decision of the Great Council was never truly in any doubt. By a lopsided margin, the Lords assembled chose Viserys Targaryen as the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Though the maesters who tallied the vote never released the actual numbers, the vote had been more than 20 to 1. King Jaehaerys had not attended the Council, but when word of their verdict had reached him, his grace thanked all the lords for their service and gratefully conferred the style of Prince of Dragonstone upon his grandson Viserys. Storm's End and Driftmark accepted the decision, if grudgingly. The vote had been so overwhelming that even Lenor's father and mother 
saw they could not hope to prevail. In the eyes of many, the Great Council of 101 AC thereby established an iron president on the matter of succession. Regardless of seniority, the iron throne of Westeros could not pass to a woman, nor through a woman, to a male descendant. Of the last years in the reign of King Jaehaerys, little and less need be said. Prince Balon had served his father as Hand of the King as well as Prince of Dragonstone, but after his death, his grace elected to divide these honours once again. As his new hand, he called upon Sir Otto Hightower, younger brother to the Lord of the Hightower of Old Town. Sir Otto brought his wife and children to court with him, and served King Jaehaerys faithfully for the three years remaining to him. As the old king's strength and wits began to fail, he was oft confined to his bed. Sir Otto's precocious 15-year-old daughter, Alicent, became his constant companion, fetching Jaehaerys his meals, reading to him, helping him to bathe and dress himself. The old king sometimes mistook her for one of his daughters, calling her by their names. Near the end, he grew certain that she was his daughter, Sarah, returned home from beyond the narrow sea. In the year 103 AC, King Jaehaerys Targaryen died in his bed as Lady Alicent Hightower was reading to him and set in Bath's unnatural history. His grace was 69 years of age and had reigned over the Seven Kingdoms since coming to the throne at the age of 14. His ashes interned with good Queen Alicent's on Dragonstone. All of Westeros mourned. Even in Dawn, where his writ had not extended, men wept and women tore their garments. In accordance with his own wishes and the decision of the Great Council of 101, his grandson Viserys succeeded him, mounting the Iron Throne as King Viserys Targaryen. At the time of his ascent, Viserys was 26 years old. Mm -hmm.